My name is Sepo Hachigonta. I'm from the University of Cape Town, uh, from the Climate Systems Analysis Group. That's the CSAG you're seeing there. And um, to start with, I would like to thank the organizing, I mean, the, the organizing committee for inviting me here. And I'll talk on the climate models and the limitations. And at least so far in the morning, I've had a big, I mean, like a good background on towards the, the, the adaptations and the mitigation. And I'm talking on one of the topics that so many people wouldn't love to talk of because of the uncertainty involved in climate models. But I'll do my best to simplify it as much as possible. My first presentation, actually, I was wanting to talk on statistical downscaling, but Bruce was like, hey, that's too detailed. You need to simplify it to downscaling and yeah, talk of that. So basically, I'll talk of climate models, the GCMs, and then go into the downscaling, why we need to downscale, and then look at the limitations of, of downscaling. And I'm sure there are a couple of experts here on climate models. So when it comes to answering some of the questions, yeah, we should have a good, <laughs> a good set of answers. I'll start with uh, just showing you this is what I've ever content. This is not a model. This is observation from satellite. It's just been pieced together. So basically, what a climate model does is to try and simulate such a system. And we've got a diverse kind of people here. And if you've never heard of or you've never seen a climate model, that equation on top there is, is a climate model. That's the most basic form of a climate model. It doesn't take into effect the greenhouse effect, but it's just energy coming in, energy coming out. So climate models are mathematical tools that try to represent this complicated kind of system. And now you all know of, of GCM, I assume we all know of general circulation models. They are not simple, they are very complex. Very complex tools, and they, they try to simulate precipitation, radiation, uh, wind, and they are very detailed and they also incorporate greenhouse uh, uh, like carbon dioxide uh, response. And that's one of the only, like, the only tools that we have for that. So, so far, this is the best knowledge that we have at the moment. And some people always ask, ask you like, hey, why do we need to use these models? They are very uncertain. But I would argue that do we just sit or do we use what we have now? Like as Bruce was talking before, like why not use, make decisions, strategic decisions based on the current knowledge that we have now, the state of the art knowledge that we have now to, to make decisions in the future besides the uncertainty that is involved. So GCMs, climate models, all have uncertainty. They've got limits that we have to, to take into consideration. I'll just talk of not talking of it, I'm sure you've seen this kind of thing. This is not observation, this is not climate model. This is like observation data set. It goes way back and then there's somebody was saying, at least if you don't believe the models, believe the observations and the variability, what's been happening. So I don't know what will happen in future if, yeah. <laughs> anyway, and we have the GCM that gives us the, proje the projections in the future. That being said, there are facts about GCMs. One, they're models. So GCMs are not reality. They are not, they are not observations. But they try to simulate the real world. So that you have to keep at the back of your mind when you're using a GCM. And talking of the IPCC, say about 2023, fourth assessment report GCMs, no one GCM is, is perfect if you're looking at impact assessment. There's no best GCM. Although you can do your own evaluation in your region, and you can remove a GCM, say for instance, if, if it's misplacing the, the ITCZ or if it's raining, instead of raining in December, the GCM is raining in, in, in April or May, then you can say, okay, this GCM is not perfect, I can, I can remove it. But in actual instance, all the GCM should be placed on the same level. And GCMs are known to, to simulate rain, I mean, temperature better than, than rainfall. Rainfall is very complicated. There are so many dynamics that make up rainfall. And mostly a GCM will have difficulty in, in capturing rainfall as compared to responses of, of, of temperature. 
and GCMs are very good at simulating large-scale large -scale systems. For instance, the highs, the lows, the wind movement, the humidity. The GCMs are known to, to do a good job when it comes to that. But when it comes to the details, they're not very, very good. So this brings us to why we need to downscale. One, I've already talked of GCMs, one of the weaknesses in terms of their spatial resolution. If you look, for instance, take for instance precipitation, a GCM basically will represent an area of about 200 kilometers, like a big grid box. If you're talking of Nairobi, there will be four boxes representing precipitation in, in Nairobi. The disadvantage of that is if you have uh, a complicated uh, uh, topography or you have rivers, you have oceans, then a GCM won't be able to, to pick up those details. For instance, I come from Cape Town and then there's Table Mountains. Mostly you find there's moisture coming from the ocean and then it hits this mountain, poof, the air rises, it cools down and then it condenses and then you have lots of rainfall on the other side of the mountain and the other mount side of the mountain it's, it's dry. Those are the effects that a GCM cannot pick. If you can argue it out if it's a flat kind of surface. Say, for instance, it's flat. There are no mountains. There are no oceans in between. There are no rivers. Then a GCM then might reproduce precipitation. You might argue that it might do a better job in that case because mostly the dynamics will be associated with, with the precipitation. But when it comes to the small details, then somebody might need to downscale. And downscaling basically is just a, a procedure of getting detailed information from a general circulation model. And so far there, I'll just talk of two basic, not basic, two most used downscaling techniques. And this figure just shows uh, the chain of downscaling. You have a GCM, you have a regional climate model, and then you can use that output to produce your, your impact assessment, be it a crop model or a hydrological, I mean, hydrological model. So this is just one of the chains. So in downscaling, these are the two main used downscaling techniques. Although there are lots of downscaling techniques, but I'll just talk of dynamic downscaling, which uses regional climate models. And I've just given an example there of Tracy and RegCM. And then we have statistical downscaling. Uh, I've listed a number of methods there. But at the University of Cape Town, mostly we use the SOM-based statistical downscaling. I'll talk of that as an example. Although there are so many other techniques that we use, we also do some regional climate downscaling. Hopefully I'm not, I won't get into that details that I, I confuse you because in, in climate models, sometimes the ways can be very difficult to understand as compared to the, to the science itself. So I'll try to be as simple as possible. So when you talk of RCM, regional climate models, how do they work? How do you downscale using regional climate models? Basically, we know we have the GCM at a bigger grid. And RCM is more of a GCM, but at a smaller scale. So it will get, a, say, for instance, a square of a GCM dynamic, and then it models within that same box of, say, 50 kilometers or 10 kilometers. Regional climate models have been used for long in say, seasonal forecasting. It's, it's like they've just been, in, now since the era of GCMs in terms of carbon dioxide came in, they've been integrated into, into the GCMs. Why they've been used is because they are good at representing the, I borrowed that picture from the UK Met office. They represent well, like the topography, they're able to capture that. They can be able to capture the the vegetation and stuff. So what a, uh, a GCM does is basically use the boundary conditions of an RCM, or what, sorry, it's the other way around. A regional climate model will use the boundary conditions of, of a GCM and incorporate, integrate that boundary condition within the GCM. So basically what you're doing there, you're saying, okay, the GCM is representing the CO2 emissions, the large scale systems, but the RCM will pick up the mountains the effects it has, say, for instance, on precipitation. And then you combine those two. So basically, that's what I was trying to point out there. And then 
we have some disadvantages and advantages of, of regional climate models. There are a lot. I've just put up a small, a few points there in terms of, of their advantages, like they're able to, uh, to account for subridge uh, forcing, like topography. They are better at representing extreme weather, f uh, extreme weather events. And if you look at the disadvantages, one of the major, major disadvantages of, of RCM kind of downscaling is that they are very expensive to run because they work on a grid scale. So it means if you're running a, a, a regional climate model over a bigger area, it means you have to do so many simulation over a tiny spot, so many grids, and that's very costly in terms of computer power. And they are dependent, very dependent on predictors. Predictors, these are just large scale systems, say humidity or, or water vapor. And that has an effect in that if the GCM is misrepresenting these predictors, the large scale systems, then that will be reflected in the downscaling procedure. So that's one of the disadvantage. And then mostly, that's just a point I'm making because mostly a GCM, the last one is an RCM, sorry, it's at a grid point and it's always smoothed because it's, it's, it's gridded. It's not at a, uh, at a point location. And statistical downscaling. Uh, basically what statistical downscaling is based on is it is based on the fact that the large scale or the local scale system is conditioned by the large scale systems. So it tries to come up with a statistical relationship between the large scale and a point station. Say for instance, precipitation at a certain station. So that's what uh, statistical downscaling is. And I'll give an example here of the SOM based statistical downscaling. A cell, SOM is basically a self-organizing map. And an easier term what this does is it tries to to rearrange the common weather patterns appearing at a certain place during a certain period. So basically what a SOM does is if, say for instance, you start by using observations from 1960 or 1970, you look at your large scale systems, you can pick maybe humidity, you say, okay, what's been happening since from 1960 till now, which, where I am now within this radius, which circulation feature has been more common and which one has been least. So basically that's what a SOM does. It characterizes the most common features and, and, the, and the least features. And from there it uses, it uses a probability distribution function, just precipitation from, from the past. It will say, okay, with this feature, this common feature, this big atmospheric feature, which precipitation was associated with, with these kind of features. So if you have, say for instance, at the, at the top corner there you have high humidity over this region during, like for today, the day to day, you say which, which precipitation amounts were associated with that feature. And you go to the least one, which precipitation features were associated with the least, uh, which, yeah, which, which features were associated with the least uh, precipitation over, over, that, over that region. So in short, what you're doing is you're saying you have a number of layers of different large scale systems, okay? Say from the GCM, but now we're starting with observations. You have your humidity, you have your geopotential heights, and then you're saying which feature was influencing precipitation over this region, over this period. And then you say, okay, this is a feature, and then we had this amount of precipitation in terms of, oopsie. Okay, I'm running out of time. Uh, I'll have to run a bit. Basically, you associate a large scale system in the observed with precipitation. And then what you do when it comes to the GCM, you get the big circulation systems from the GCM, and then you say, you sample from the PDFs you, you got from uh, the observations. So in this kind of methodology, when you're downscaling in statistical, the same based downscaling, you don't use any precipitation from the GCM. You sample from what used to happen in the past, and then you sample it in the future. So what you use from the GCM is a large scale. We have lots of confidence in the large scale systems, you use a GCM to do that, and then in the local scale, you use the observed precipitation. And then there are uh, pros and cons to statistical downscaling, just like with uh, regional climate models. 
their high dependency in terms of uh, their disadvantages on predictor variables. If a large scale system, a GCM is misrepresenting a certain feature, big feature, then that will be transferred back to the, uh, to the statistical downscaling. Just a point there, statistical downscaling does not seek to produce the real world, but rather generates a realistic time evolution, like in terms of inter annual interseasonal variability and daily time scales in terms of extreme events and stuff. And the some of the limitations when it comes to downscaling or just other models, we have limited data in what we know now. And there's gaps in the knowledge, there's gaps on the data, there's gaps on, on the techniques that we use to generate the data. And mostly, if you look at most African countries, just observation, most downscaling techniques be, uh, depend on, on the observation data set. And we don't have a good network observ of observations. So you find that there are big gaps in your observations, and then that can't generate a good downscaling technique. So we need to ensure that our data set is, is quite good. I'll just jump to, to the yeah, conclusion since I've got a minute now. Just some facts about GCMs and downscaling. We need to make choices today based on what we have now instead of waiting, and we need to, to make sure that we organize as good or characterize our observed or baseline climate as much as possible. And one of the points that an earlier presenter also made was the possibility, not the possibility, the need to use more, more GCMs. Because the more you, you use the GCMs, at least you're able to generate the median of the GCMs, and then you're able to produce the spread of the GCMs. At least you have more confidence in the story that you're giving to your, your, your policymakers. And we need to downscale or, or upscale when, when it's necessary, when you have all the observation data set and when you have the GCMs, you have the technical know-how, you, you have to downscale if, 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 if you have to. I think I'll... Thank you.